Hi, I'm Lee Teschler, Executive Editor of Design World and EE World. And I'm Michelle DeFrangia, Assistant Editor of Design World. And today we are tearing down a Fitbit Charge, a wristband that tracks steps, distance, calories burned, floors climbed, and active minutes, monitors sleep, and has a caller ID. The watch also syncs with Bluetooth and comes with a charging cable. Now, it's basically impossible to tear down a Fitbit without destroying it, so we've got a lot of pieces parts here. When you look at the electronics, a couple things stand out. One is a little vibration motor from Jinlong Machinery Electronics in China that's used to signal the wearer about specific events. At the other end of the main circuit board, you also see a little OLED display. And that board sits in a sort of a cradle formed by the part of the watch that's up against your wrist. To understand what the Fitbit actually does, we think it's easiest to skip the main circuit board for a minute and start our discussion of the watch with the part of it that's up against your skin. When you look at the back of the Fitbit wristband, you can see a sensor. We have a close-up of what that sensor looks like. So exactly what are we looking at in this close-up, Lee? Well, what you see here is both a sensor and a couple of dots. The dots are infrared LEDs. The two prongs above the sensor assembly comprise the connection for the recharging cable. The sensor is actually an optical sensor that detects light from the LEDs reflecting from your skin. The optical sensor and the LEDs collectively make up an optical heart rate sensor that works via pulse oximetry. That is a measurement technique that takes advantage of the fact that oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin have different optical properties. With every heartbeat, there's a spike in arterial oxygenated blood, which is detected as a change in the absorbance or reflectance of LED light. So the optical sensor measures the amount of LED light reflecting from the blood under your skin. The reflectance is a bit different during a heartbeat, and the sensor will detect this periodic signal from which the heart rate is extracted. If we flip the watch housing over and look at the back of the sensor, I also see a chip attached there. Right. The optical sensor and the LEDs are on a substrate together with an integrated circuit. Judging by its markings, that chip seems to be made by Texas Instruments and is an array of op amps optimized for amplifying super small sensor signals. We can guess that it's put close to the sensor rather than on the main Fitbit circuit board so it can amplify the optical signals coming from the sensor before they have to go through a connector to get to the main circuit board. That would make sense because the signals coming from the optical sensor are potentially minute and noisy. So you can see why the Fitbit designers might want to boost them up as close as possible to where they originate. And no matter how good the connector to the main circuit board is, it's a potential source of noise that could be significant for the super low level changes in reflectance you'd be dealing with when detecting heartbeats. Before we move on, what else can we point out about the part of the watch that holds the sensor substrate? Well, the other interesting bits here are the connection for the recharging cable, which is reinforced with its own metal frame. And as we've said, the heart rate sensor connects to the rest of the circuitry through a flex circuit. But what's interesting is that the uh, connector to the flex circuit lies directly over top the optical sensor. We might surmise that the Fitbit designers really wanted to minimize the chance of those heart rate signals getting garbled. And that might be one of the reasons for situating the connector right where it is. It might pro provide some shielding against other signals floating around on the main circuit board. I actually see two flex connectors. Correct. One for the optical sensor we mentioned. The other connects the display to the main circuit board. The display is an OLED which makes sense because OLEDs consume relatively little power compared to some of their alternatives. Both those flex connectors attach to the bottom of the Fitbit circuit board. The lithium polymer battery sits next to this side of the board. That doesn't leave much room for the circuit board components, but there are three components on that side of the board that we should talk about. Right. One of them was pretty easy to identify. It's a lithium iron battery charger IC from Texas Instruments that regulates charge voltage and current. The other point of interest is an altitude sensor from Measurement Specialties. That altitude sensor is basically just a MEMS pressure sensor calibrated for altitude. Its spec sheet says it has a resolution of 20 centimeters. The sensor module includes an ultra-low power 24-bit analog digital converter. 
but there's a chip right next to it that's a bit of a mystery. We generally use markings on the chips to figure out what they are. In this case, the markings are definitive. All we have are clues to its identity. One of those clues is that the chip sits super close to the altitude sensor, so it can easily have something to do with altitude sensor readings. Also, a close look at the circuit board reveals there's a connection from the chip to the side button that you push for getting readings. There's another connection from the chip to the TI battery charger IC. So you might conclude our mystery chip probably has something to do with the readouts of the altitude sensor. What about the other side of the board? That side of the board is more populated and a bit more interesting. When you first pop the plastic cover off the Fitbit, that's the side of the board you see. The OLED display sits on top of it, pressed against a piece of plastic that both supports the display and doubles as an antenna for the Bluetooth connection. The metal bracket, which serves as a supporting frame for the recharger cable, wraps around and seems to help keep the OLED readout stable as well. Adhesive attaches the OLED to the Bluetooth antenna assembly that it sits on. And the antenna assembly is held to the circuit board by two super tiny Torx screws. When you unscrew those, you release part of the antenna assembly supporting the OLED. The rest of the antenna assembly can then be pulled off the circuit board to reveal the components on the board. So what kind of components sit on the top side of the board? Well, there are several smaller ICs on this side of the board that we just struck out trying to identify. Uh, the markings and PCB traces just aren't definitive enough to figure them out. One of them, based on the pinout we see, might be a low dropout linear regulator from TI. But there are plenty of other chips we can identify. We can start with the T Texas Instruments TPS61093 chip that sits at the end of the board near the solder connections for the battery and the vibration motor. This chip serves as a power supply to the OLED display. The board also contains two different processors. Two of them? Two of them. And one interesting thing is that they aren't identical. One is an 8-bit unit, the other is a 32-bit unit and both come from ST Microsystems. So why two processors? Well, there's a lot going on in the Fitbit. There's undoubtedly a lot of signal processing associated with pulling a valid heart rate out of the data coming in from the optical sensor. The same can probably be said for figuring out the number of steps coming from the data coming in from not one but two accelerometers. So we can speculate that the 8-bit processor is there to handle mundane tasks, such as display management, maybe dealing with a Bluetooth connection that comes via a Nordic NRE8001 chip and the user input. The 32-bit processor probably handles the interpretation of the sensor data. Now, did I hear you say there were two accelerometers on this Fitbit as well? Yes, indeed. And that was one of the little surprises we found <laughs> here. There seem to be two identical STM LIS2DH3 axis accelerometers on this Fitbit. According to the spec sheet, these are low power devices capable of measuring accelerations with an output data rate of between 1 and 5.3 kilohertz. Well, if the accelerometer can measure motion in three axes, why would you need two of them? Well, we don't know that for sure, but we can speculate. If you look at the academic literature on biomechanics, there's a lot of work done on using arrays of redundant 3D accelerometers to more accurately estimate the motion of joints and angular velocity errors. With that in mind, remember that a Fitbit estimates the number of steps you take based on the motion of your arm. We might surmise that it's probably tough to distinguish the accelerations that result from taking a step versus those that result from raising your arm to take a swig from a beer stein or something like that. So our guess is that it takes two accelerometers to make those kinds of distinctions. And I'd further bet that the designers of the Fitbit wish they had room to include even more accelerometers on the circuit board to make that job easier. Well, Lee, you've given me a great idea. The fitness watch product area is pretty crowded. So I'm going to invent a watch that counts the number of times you drink from that beer stein. Sort of an unfitness watch. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see what happens when you go out for your first round of venture funding. <laughs> well, now we are going to do some field testing of my fabulous beer stein and watch idea. 
For more teardown videos like this one, visit designworldonline.com or eeworldonline.com. And thanks for watching.